Previously on the West Indies at war, the June 1914 assassination of Archduke Ferdinand and his wife quickly snowballed into a global war. As loyal subjects of the British Crown, people of the British West Indies began sending gifts of money and foodstuff to aid the war effort. Thousands of West Indian men waited at the ready to fight for king and country, but only white and light-skinned men were allowed to enlist. We had advanced only a few yards when a murderous fire was opened on us and with the exception of a sergeant, a private and myself, all were wiped out. We continued on laughing and wondering who would be the next to fall. The private then fell, I followed, and I heard that the sergeant was also shot down. Stuart Scott. It is June 1915. The war envelops countries far and wide. Japan and Italy throw in their lot with the Allies, which consist of France, Britain and Russia. While the Ottoman Empire and Bulgaria stand with the central powers of Germany and Austria-Hungary. The Allies draw support from their colonial territories in Africa, Canada, India, Australia and New Zealand. On the Western Front, the Allied forces are entrenched in France and Belgium. Pinned down by the heavy guns of the German artillery, they are unable to advance. On the Eastern Front, Russian forces are outgunned. The fearsome million-man army diminishes slowly with every assault. The losses are severe and morale is low. This was an appalling sort of stalemated war where thousands upon thousands of lives might be lost in a single day and yet neither armed forces advanced more than a few inches and so on. In the trenches of this war we have millions of victims and most of these victims were European victims and we, are, we were fighting in these trenches for years and nothing changed. The terrain in Europe reflects months of unremitting struggle between men with powerful weapons fighting in the pouring rain. Jamaican Norman Manley, who would go on to lead his country to independence, would describe many dead men, three quarters buried in mud. He spotted them by an emerging hand, foot, or even a head. It was indescribable, he said. The air is polluted by dust and smoke from the near constant shell fire and tinged with the yellow hues of chemical warfare. On the ground, trenches snake across fields and farms through towns and villages stretching from the North Sea coast of Belgium southward through France, finally reaching the southernmost point in Alsace at the Swiss border. The trenches are dark and damp. Soldiers hunker down, living day and night with the possibility of death at every flash of light or crack of an explosion. Outside of Europe, the African theater of war rages. The Allied forces engage in tedious guerrilla warfare with Germany for control of the German West African territories of Togo and Cameroon. In Gallipoli, all attempts to usurp the Turkish forces stationed on the peninsula fail miserably, and the Allies suffer heavy casualties fighting at sea and on land. After an estimated loss of 200,000 soldiers, an evacuation of the remaining forces begins in December 1915. The campaign is a disaster for the Allies. 
In the Middle East, Britain struggles to fend off attacks from Turkish troops in Mesopotamia. Battles rage across land, sea and air, leaving only a path of death and destruction in their wake. contempt for my fellow non-commissioned officers, and I was later to discover that a sense of superiority was a good protection from the obsessions that color feelings can create. Color had meant nothing to me in the years before the war in Jamaica. I was by nature a rebel and little affected by what people thought of me. Norman Manley. Famously Norman Manley who had a stellar career at school in Jamaica and had been awarded a scholarship to Oxford University. Now, those circumstances would have guaranteed an officer's commission to a young British man. He could not have got an officer's commission. He served throughout World War I in the ranks. He rose to the non-commissioned officer rank, but could not get a commission. Norman Manley was promoted to the rank of corporal in the field artillery, but his relationship with various officers was strained. After one encounter with his sergeant, Manley accepted a demotion and transferred to the D Battalion of the 39th Division. The policy of the War Office throughout World War I was not to grant officers commissions to anybody who was not, and I quote, of pure European descent. The British War Office did not feel that black people should fight against white enemies. I mean, it was that extreme. Because they were racist, that's all. In Britain, it was almost taken for granted that a young man of a middle class or upper class background, a young man who had been to a good secondary school, any young man who was a university student or a university graduate, any young man who was a doctor or a lawyer, plus the more aristocratic young men, automatically got officer's commission. That is, they could have been 18 years of old and know nothing about military life, but they automatically became a lieutenant and moved up. That was denied completely to young men of similar social standing from the Caribbean. And this was a British? policy, but if you do a look to the French army, it was normal to use black people. If the German army used Africans in the war against the British in Africa, but the British were really the most, I have to say this, really the most racist people in this discussion in the war in the beginning. Also, they felt very uncomfortable with black people, also later. So this is why the delay was so long for the foundation of the British West Indian Regiment. Regardless, West Indian men of colour remain focused on playing their part. Of course, these were young men seeking glory, and as such, you know, they would have found some excitement in heading off to distant lands to fight a war. And of course, it would have raised their esteem and, and their standing in society as well, if they said we're part of the West Indies Regiment. A soldier had a certain kind of status in the society. It was a privilege to be a soldier because it meant that you had moved from the lowest classes up into a more acceptable class in society. It gave you something to do, you know, if, you're, if you didn't have a job. I think that a lot of these young men went because they had nothing at home. It, it was opportunity as well. So there was no difficulty at all getting recruits from the West Indies. On one hand, the desire to fight was important to men across the islands. On the other hand, British colonials feared the possible repercussions of arming and training the black masses who might one day rise up against them. After the Morant Bay Rebellion in Jamaica in 1865 and other uprisings and riots in the 1870s and 80s, the British colonial office 
said to the war office, look, if you use black soldiers, when they will come back to us, we cannot integrate them because they know fighting, killing, and then they will make uprisings and riots and they will fight for independence. And Political activists saw their involvement in the war as a path to political autonomy in the West Indies. White plantation owners feared that further rejection of local men by the war office would lead to unrest. However, despite the numerous requests the colonial office sent to the war office for a West Indies regiment, the answer was still the same. No. By April 1915, negotiations between the colonial office and the war office stagnate. The War Office is prepared to accept a West Indian contingent to serve as a peacekeeping force in the German West African territories of Togo and Cameroon. However, this is not in keeping with the grand dreams the men have of serving the Empire. There was a very masculine ideology that the most glorious thing a young man can do is fight for his country. These were proud men. True, most of them were working class, peasants, laborers, and so on, but they were proud men, and they had volunteered for reasons of pride as much as anything else. Fully nine months into the war, King George V intervenes as an arbitrator, suggesting that a West Indian regiment be raised and employed in Egypt. Secretary of War Lord Kitchener agrees, and the announcement for recruitment of the British West Indies Regiment is made on the 26th of October 1915. In all, the regiment consisted of 12 contingents and over 15,000 men from around the region. But even in the Caribbean, among fellow countrymen, racism reared its head. The white West Indians and this is throughout the Caribbean, refused to join any contingent, any platoon in which there were blacks, unless those white West Indians were the leaders, the captains. That's the only position they would accept, captains over black soldiers, but they would not join as fellow soldiers. And so they formed their own contingent of white West Indians, or those who believed they were white, which is called the Merchants and Planters Contingent. The rumor was, and the facts seem to show, that the merchants selected only white or brown people. But though I was dark, I was widely known as a coming cricketer, and I kept goal for the college team in the first-class football league. I was very tall and very fit, so on the morning when I should have been at school, I went down to the office where one of the big merchants, perhaps the biggest of all, examined the would-be warriors. Young man after young man went in, and I was not obviously inferior to any of them in anything. The merchant talked to each, asked for references, and arranged for further examination as the case might be. When my turn came, I walked to his desk. He took one look at me, saw my dark face, and, shaking his head vigorously, motioned me violently away. C.L.R. James the merchants and planters contingents were comprised of the sons of elite white West Indian families. These soldiers formed five contingents and personally funded their passage to England. A similar group was formed in Barbados, the citizens contingent. An article in Grenada's West Indian newspaper commented, Citizens contingent? What a name! What splitting of hairs! If there is a citizen's contingent, what condition does the Barbados public contingent represent? Those who are not citizens. Among the young men who enrolled for service at the front in the second merchant's contingent was Carlos J. Polony, son of Mr. A. Polony, Assistant Receiver General of Trinidad and Tobago. 
He was sent to France towards the middle of 1916. Whilst on duty near the firing line, a shell exploded quite near him and he died from the shock. Yet another member of the merchant's contingent was to offer his life as a sacrifice for his country, Private James Eversley, son of MTF Eversley. He gave up a promising position with the Trinidad Electric Company to go to the front. He contracted pneumonia and after a rather long illness, died at Brompton Hospital. It is our sad duty to report the death from wounds received on the battlefield somewhere in France of trooper Harold Knox. Harold left in the early months of the war with the merchant's contingent. His death was due to wounds received from the bursting of a bomb near him. As recruitment of black and coloured West Indians begins in full force, anxiety turns to excitement. Good hearing, healthy teeth, basic education and well-formed limbs are just some of the requirements that are to be met so that the British Caribbean can put her best foot forward for empire. Recruiters appeal to one's sense of duty to the empire, even encouraging women to urge their men to fight. These people were proud. My husband is in the war fighting for the British Empire. When he will come back, he's a hero and so on. For others, it was a question of income. Many people went to war because of a better economic uh, goal. So they thought when, I, when my husband will go to war, uh, we have a constantly salary, we have more benefits. If I am a very poor laborer catching my you know what, to try and keep ends together. At least in the army, I am guaranteed regular pay, uniform, and three meals a day. So there's that strictly economic um, thing, which must have influenced some. Well, I mean, they were paid, I, I'm not sure what. I know the British soldiers were paid a shilling a day or something. I don't know what applied. And I think their families were given something, but I don't know that that was a highly motivating factor. It was probably more a question of something to do. And adventure, the whole idea of going off to another country. The dream of adventure and the allure of a promising future beyond the poverty of their daily lives attracts thousands of men to the Queen's Park Savannah to parade before recruiters and a crowd of curious onlookers in the hope of being selected to get on the ship and sent off to England. But the glory they seek will elude many of them. The British West Indies Regiment would serve hundreds of miles from the Western Front in Egypt, East Africa, Mesopotamia and eventually France. Of the 12 battalions of the regiment, only the 3rd and 4th were sent to the Western Front in France. One of the ironies of history was that um, the British West India Regiment, which was the, the, the black soldiers from the Caribbean, in an, a racially charged Europe, they were not considered important enough to be put to fight against white soldiers because they were not uh, put on, on the battlefront in, in, in France and in Flanders and so on. They were there bringing up the rear, you know, uh, bringing ammunition, bringing food, um, digging up toilets, uh, making trenches. So they were, they were always behind. And the white soldiers went in front to be massacred by, by the Germans and to be killed by the, 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 the use of their own mustard gas, which quite often blew back. Now, from our perspective, that's a lucky break because the mortality rate at the European front was horrendous. But it didn't seem like that to those proud Jamaican or Trinidadian soldiers. They wanted to be where the action was. This was not allowed to them. While the men struggled with the disappointment of their lots, West Indian women were making hands-on contributions to the war effort. 
Trinidadian Audrey Jeffers, a black middle-class woman who would one day become the first female member of the Legislative Council, was studying in England when war broke out. Jeffers went to work attending to wounded West African soldiers. So Audrey Jeffers would have certainly encountered and experienced discrimination and that would have colored her ideas and vision. She was able to involve herself working alongside the West India Committee to establish groups to support the African troops as well. We do not see many women moving from the West Indies to Britain to involve themselves directly in the war effort. This is largely because there wasn't really a targeted recruiting system for them, particularly nursing. The British government really didn't want African women involved in their nursing service. If women wanted to get involved with the war and possibly had the resources to, this would be women of the white elite, and they would have had to have done this privately, independently. One such woman was Myrie Chisholm, the daughter of a Trinidadian cocoa planter, who, along with her companion Elsie Knocker, served as nurses on the Western Front, taking care of wounded soldiers. They become involved in a group of nurses who are going to work on the front as ambulance drivers and they learn to drive ambulances. So nurse and ambulance driver working together and they are riding their motorbikes and they're on in, in Pervise in Belgium, right there on the border. It's an extraordinary story. They are the only women nurses who were absolutely at the front and they picked up Germans as well as allies. They did not refused to look after German injured. But while Myrie did not discriminate between wounded soldiers, the same largesse did not hold true in the Caribbean. Many German nationals were arrested and detained for the duration of the war. Their businesses were confiscated and auctioned off to raise funds for the war effort. Similar treatment was meted out all over the empire. The German community in Trinidad suffered a lot here during the war. They became enemy alliance, they went to internment camps. By the way, some of the Germans here on the island uh, became, uh, came under pressure, uh, went to jail, were announced as spies. Also Trinidadians who had friends, German friends, uh, were suspected. In the Caribbean, the economic climate is directly affected by the Great War in Europe. The First World War is the war of the cars. It is the war of the tanks. It is the war of the submarines. And it is finally also the war of the planes. And for all that, we need fuel. And uh, this fuel came out of petrol, gas, as well as gasoline. Oil becomes very important in Trinidad and Tobago from 1910, when there's the enormous discovery of oil, particularly down in the southeastern peninsula, that Guagua area. And then the British uh, Navy makes a very important decision in 1910, and that is a switch over from coal to oil. And once that happens, then Trinidad becomes enormously important. The growth of the nascent oil industry notwithstanding, as the war dragged on, life in the Caribbean got harder. The war itself, with the interruption of trade, you have of course the scarcity of goods. Um, Trinidad is an import economy. We imported most of our food. And so with that scarcity, you have huge inflation. Food prices begin to skyrocket. In Trinidad and Tobago, the price of milk increases from 5 pence to 8 pence. Rice, once 1.5 pence a pound, rises to 3 pence per pound. Governments throughout the Caribbean implement price controls, but they do little to curb inflation. When men go off to fight the war, the women are left to do what they've always done, I think. They are left to take care of the family, and um, their responsibility, of course, is to ensure that 
their children have food on the table, that they have clothing. And so you find that women now have to find alternative sources of employment. Now, this is of course to put into context the British West Indies Regiment, where we do not have huge, huge numbers going off to fight the war. So it may not necessarily have affected the female population, say, of Trinidad significantly. Nonetheless, discontent over the cost of living begins to simmer, but not just among civilians. Although loyal to Britain, enthusiasm for the war is waning, especially after the third contingent of the British West Indies Regiment set sail for England from Jamaica in March 1916. Rumours begin circulating that German submarines are in the Atlantic Ocean, and so the Verdala is ordered to go north to Halifax in Canada. It is winter. There is neither heat nor warm clothing. A blizzard hits. Aboard the Verdala decided change of climate and weather. Instructions were given and men taught how to fold the great coats according to military requirements. Observance of fresh cases of slightly swollen feet, the opinion was that thawing had set in as we were getting into warmer weather. But it was not anticipated that these cases would develop to the alarming extent that they did later. By night, the number of fresh cases was rapidly increasing. My feet gave me a twitch and I decided to examine them. One was slightly swollen. I readily applied the oil lotion that was issued and believed that there would be relief by morning and the end of my bite. Wednesday, March 29th, still more cases of frostbites were showing up themselves. The situation was becoming worse. My little twitch had spread overnight to many. By evening, I was walking with discomfort. Thursday, March 30th, disembarkment of more frostbite cases. 80 men were sent to one hospital and a smaller lot to another hospital. In the afternoon, all other men who were unable to march, myself counted in this latter, disembarked. Some had to be taken on the backs of fit men and the less unfortunate, like myself, limped down the gangway. Sergeant Charles Rickard. Five men would die from exposure to the cold. 600 men would suffer from frostbite, 100 of whom would need to have limbs amputated. This tragedy would become known as the Halifax Incident. We were wanted to fight. We didn't have to. They, they, they never conscripted a single Trinidadian. They were all volunteers, everyone, 3,000 of them. Men love, love soldiers and they love, they love warfare. They've always loved it. The men of the West Indies regiments, disappointed and bored, labored away in the Middle East and Africa. Although they celebrated the victory of being mobilized, their war had just begun.